My name is Ryan Mulholland and I have the privilege of serving on the professional services team that is dedicated to ensuring the success of our state and local government customers like New York City. Uh, I've been engaged with New York City Cyber Command since December of 2017 and in that time I've had the absolute privilege of working with a dedicated team of New Yorkers that are really focused on providing the very best in cybersecurity for New York and her residents. Uh, in that time, I've watched as they built a new approach to cybersecurity and one which I believe will be the future of the way we all look to cybersecurity in the future. And it's that dedicated team and their efforts here today that we get to talk about uh, for the first time. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Colin Ahern today, or pardon me, Colin Ahern. He is the Deputy Chief Information Officer leading security sciences for New York City Cyber Command. Prior to join, joining the cybersecurity effort in New York City, Colin, year, pardon me, Colin served for seven years as an officer in the United States Army, where he served two tours in Afghanistan and as commander of, cyber, of a cyberspace operations company. After serving in the Army, Colin worked in the financial sector focused on security engineering and cyber threat intelligence. In addition to degrees from Tulane and NYU, Colin is, is a certified information security services professional and a Google certified professional data engineer. Along with his wife and daughter, Colin lives in the bustling borough of Brooklyn. Do me a favor, please welcome Colin Ahern to the stage, Deputy CISO for New York City Cyber Command. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> um, so behind a simple idea is complex engineering. Uh, and when we started this journey about 18 months ago, our boss, Jeff Brown, the Chief Information Security Officer of the City of New York, uh, threw down a gauntlet. And that was to construct a completely separate responder environment that was purpose-built to detect and respond to cyber threats against city systems. And we call that system Juggernaut. Uh, and behind a cool demo is a big team. Uh, what you see here is a product of multiple teams all working together at New York City Cyber Command throughout the government of the city of New York and throughout many of our vendor partners uh, like Google. Uh, we think our approach is instructive for those seeking to enhance the way that they manage cybersecurity relevant data, approach technology systems that are large and complex, and that they want to be resilient and efficient. Uh, and this is just one small part of what we do at New York City Cyber Command that we also affectionately refer to as NYC3. So if I drop that little acronym during this demo, that's, uh, that's what it is. Um, and we, this is a joint effort with Google. If you saw just outside at the booth, uh, we have a demo in the public sector area. So this is a joint effort. Uh, and we wanted to solve this problem at New York scale, or Google scale, uh, if you like. Uh, and we wanted to call this juggernaut because we know there's going to be roadblocks along the way. We know this is a long journey. Um, but we know that we have the resources to overcome those hurdles. We also like the juggernaut, if you didn't know this, is British for a large heavy truck. <clears throat> and we think of our pipeline uh, as a highway of sorts. Uh, so that's, that's kind of relevant. Um, so this is what we're going to cover today. <clears throat> a little bit about, excuse me, New York City Cyber Command and what we do. I'll talk in depth about the data pipeline, some of the principles, some of the key facts. I'll do a demo. I'll talk about some key decisions we made like zero touch infrastructure as code, zero trust, beyond corp model for context aware access. And I also talk about what we believe to be the future of this space, machine learning and advanced automation. Um, and you see there a pretty interesting fact, 8.6 million. That is the population just within the five boroughs. So not including the larger New York metro area, which is about 20 million, or even the Northeast megalopolis, uh, which is many more millions uh, still. Uh, and along with this large uh, metropolis is a large and complex IT infrastructure. We have three slash 16 public IP addresses. That's about 194,000. We have hundreds and hundreds of web applications ranging from an application residents can use to see when their street is going to be plowed to nyc.gov, one of the 500 most visited websites in the United States. So a very big complex infrastructure uh, that we defend. Uh, so New York City Cyber Commander, NYC3, doing right by New Yorkers. Number one, uh, we're a new government agency charged with defending New York City and the city of New York from cyber threats and providing tools so that residents, visitors, and businesses can lead safer lives online. 
Uh, we have a dedicated team of cybersecurity and technology professionals that monitor city systems 24-7, 365 in collaboration with other city agencies such as the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications uh, and other stakeholders uh, to ensure our cities are safe and resilient from cyber threats. Uh, and number three, we believe that cybersecurity is a public safety issue on behalf of city government and this administration, we lead the NYC Secure Initiative, which is a policy position that says cybersecurity is not only a public safety issue, but one in which your government owes you something. It owes you actual tools that you can use to lead safer digital lives. Uh, we have three tactics uh, under this policy. Number one is an enterprise grade mobile threat detection app called the NYC Secure App, available on the iOS and Android uh, app, app stores. You can just or Google NYC Secure App. Uh, and we believe that security and privacy are not mutually exclusive. Our mobile threat detection app does all of its work on the mobile phone. It doesn't send anything outside of the phone. It collects no PII. It doesn't even have the rights to PII on your mobile device. Uh, two, uh, we partnered with a nonprofit organization called Quad9, which offers free privacy respecting recursive DNS filtering. And we're rolling that out to all free public Wi Fi networks by the end of this year. And that's because we believe that residents who use our Wi Fi should not be victimized uh, as they do so. Uh, and number three, uh, those of you that saw in the Wall Street Journal last Thursday, our agency and my boss, Jeff Brown, partnered with the Manhattan DA, uh, Cy Vance, and the commissioner of the New York City Police Department, James O'Neill on cyber critical services and infrastructure. It is a local cybersecurity critical infrastructure focused organization designed to break down barriers between organizations that are across verticals uh, and be selfless and, selfless and ruthless about defending the city of New York against cyber threats. Uh, so very briefly, that's the executive order that created us in July of 2017, executive order 28 signed by Bill de Blasio. Uh, and Broadly speaking, we wanted to undertake a very substantial problem in a new way. Uh, and we have three goals at a high level. One is build a secure cloud-based security log aggregation platform for city systems. Two, enable via this platform alerting, visualization, and analytics for cybersecurity professionals, both analytics that we had with existing vendor partner relationships, capabilities that we might acquire in the future, uh, and some capabilities that we develop in-house. Uh, and three, and maybe most philosophically, we want to scale non-linearly with two kinds of demands or two kinds of issues that we face. Number one, demand on city services that is delivered by, with, and through technology system grows every single day. Uh, in addition to three slash 16 public IP addresses, we have over 400,000 workstation servers and mobile devices that are city owned. We have another half a million or so connected devices ranging from water meters uh, to the GPS devices on the snow plows that enable the app to tell you when it's gonna plow your street. So this is a really, really, really big and complicated infrastructure. And each one of those devices in some way, large or small, expands the threat surface. Uh, and for those of you that saw Mike Aiello's talk Yesterday, uh, we want to reduce that threat surface to a meaningfully small area that we as defenders can interact with. Um, and additionally, the threats against any one of those points uh, increases every single day. Uh, five years ago, for you to take advantage of the most advanced hacking tools allegedly made available by the National Security Agency and other governments around the world, you would have to work for those agencies. Uh, if those of you that remember the Eternal Blue, not Petya, WannaCry, uh, these are leveraging alleged NSA uh, type capabilities. Uh, and you could today, right now, pull out your laptop and go to GitHub and have the power of the NSA. So that is a fundamentally, categorically different world uh, than even three or five years ago. Uh, and we need to be able to respond to that. Uh, and we think that our data pipeline does that. Uh, to do that, we have a number of core beliefs. One is security. Uh, the ability to do comprehensive retrospective search on our security telemetry in a separate environment fundamentally changes the strategic dynamic between us and our adversaries. It enables detection based on a variety of sources with a variety of partners in a secure way. It can guide detection and response efforts. It can lead to faster remediation and faster detection. And over time, allow us to leverage a key asset, our data, in order to become predictive. And we'll talk about why we think that's the case. Uh, additionally, we want 
our confidence in the team, confidence in the tools, and confidence in the plan. Uh, so we're, obviously I spoke about the incredible team we have at New York City Cyber Command. I'm gonna talk about just one of the tools we have uh, and going forward, the future, Zero Trust Networking, uh, our plan for fundamentally changing the battle space uh, with regards to cyber threats. Uh, two, flexibility. Cybersecurity is a team sport. Uh, we need a security product agnostic environment that can allow multiple tools to operate either concurrently or in parallel. Uh, we want to be able to test, add new capabilities, remove them rapidly. Uh, we want to be data-centric, not product-centric. Uh, and broadly speaking, we want to move from a request and response framework to a publish and subscribe framework. Uh, and that's one that enables the future things like machine learning, things like automation. Uh, additionally, we need to build federation and multi-tenancy from the ground up. We need to leverage metadata. We need to apply this metadata so that we can be fast. This is a problem that has to be done at machine, machine speed, uh, not one at people speed. Uh, two, <coughs> data-centric. Uh, what does data-centric mean? At some level, it's about decision advantage. We want to provide our network operators and defenders with decision advantage over their adversary because we want our defenders and network operators to be able to know and do more faster than the adversary. Uh, and you can't hire your way out of that problem. Obviously, it starts with a fantastic team, but that's not where it ends. It is about having the right data to the right analyst or analytical process at the right time, with the right context. Uh, you need context not to negatively impact business operations, and you can't do that without data that is trusted, reliable, and verifiable. So, uh, to kind of restate that problem in a, in a slightly different way, each and every day we're asking IT professionals and security teams to make decisions, whether to take an asset offline, whether to remove access to a system from some user. Uh, they are making a trade-off. They are reducing some risk which might be present in a system or in the future via the action of an adversary, but they're degrading the usability of that system in some fundamental way. Uh, we want this process to happen as rapidly and effectively as possible. Right time, right data, right analyst. Uh, and what we face today is not just database access, insider threat, SQL injection, all these other things. Uh, it is the compilation of the interaction of these forces within a situation of extremely high uncertainty. If anybody's ever remediated a security or a technical incident of extreme complexity, uh, you know that when the incident first starts, you can't even be sure of what you know. Uh, and what we're demonstrating with this pipeline is that we are uh, removing, we are systematically removing uncertainty from these decisions for our consumers, our consumers being the security operations center professionals that 24-7, 365 defend the city from cyber threats, uh, and the network and, and IT operations professionals which run those systems every single day. Uh, so as a extension of that metaphor, we need to systematically apply insight. People, you know, the term machine learning and advanced automation, uh, people don't actually want machine learning, they want learning. They don't want advanced automation, they want the right thing done as fast as possible. So what our platform enables is those workflows to be systematically understood, to be programmatically applied, and to be repeated at scale. Um, and like all organizations, like all projects of this scale and complexity, there's a number of challenges. Uh, one is the scale, volume, and federation. As I intimated, uh, the city is an organization of, it has over 330,000 employees. As I said, 400,000 endpoints, a total of about a million systems. There's 100 agencies ranging uh, from the absolutely incredible public safety professionals of the NYPD and FDNY patrolling the streets every single day, to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs doing absolutely critical, cutting edge work in support of at-risk communities. 50,000 police officers, you know, much, much, much less than that, uh, immigration uh, and civil service professionals. Uh, so that scale, volume, and federation makes it a very large, complex organization. Uh, two, as I mentioned, the threat surface and attack surface is growing. Uh, three, I mentioned why platform approaches for, some, for an organization like ours are not sufficient. Uh, and um, while they might be sufficient for some, an entity of our size and sophistication is never going to be satisfied with a single vendor. Uh, and number four is technical debt. The city has been doing computers since the mid-60s. 
Uh, the city has been offering services to residents, visitors, and businesses with mainframes since the days of the IBM System 360. Uh, so this is an organization which has a long and storied history of using computing to further the public good, and that means that we must approach our legacy systems with data, not wishful thinking. Uh, again, you know, how do we deal with more data, more formats, and more locations? More formats and more data, obviously, I talked about the, you know, all these systems I mentioned throw off data, large and small. More formats, it's not just a syslog feed over UDP anymore. We have API-based access. We have platform and software as a service offerings that the city uses. Uh, and more locations. The city has a hybrid cloud strategy like many organizations, so it's not just on-premise data centers. It's not just one public cloud provider. It's all of the above. So with all that really as background, our approach for security data is one, cloud native. We are built primarily on Apache Beam, an open source data programming model. And the TLDR of Apache Beam, uh, it is highly parallel, so it's fast. And you can apply the same data transformations both on batch and in stream. Now what that means is for a small, dedicated, growing organization like ourselves, uh, we can spend more time understating our data and transforming it in a way that our consumers will find, will find meaningful than on either running infrastructure, because we leverage cloud data flow from Google, uh, than on the deep technical underpinnings of a data management model itself. Two is zero trust, zero touch. Uh, we believe that the Beyond Corp architecture uh, obviously spearheaded by Google uh, and now embraced by others in the Beyond Corp Alliance announced yesterday, uh, is the architecture of the future. Uh, briefly, uh, Beyond Corp or Zero Trust is removing authorization and access decisions from single points and making them compilations of decisions either about what you know about a user, what you know about a system, or some combination of the above. Uh, and Zero Touch, utilizing infrastructure as code, enables us to scale rapidly, elastically uh, and apply best practices. Uh, and we're not just security professionals, we're also evangelists. So this is an opportunity through this project to eat our own dog food with regards to Beyond Corp and Zero Touch that we can bring to city agencies uh, along with the security outcomes we deliver to our stakeholders. Uh, number three, modularity. It's a flexible architecture. One of the key differentiators is that this is a publish and subscribe architecture rather than a request and response. So that means we can take things out and add them very rapidly. The fact that we combine this with infrastructure as code increases our velocity and our reliability. So that's all. those are things that are, are worth focusing on. Uh, and it's fast. We intentionally built this to be fast. And I think the next slide I actually have some of the metrics. Uh, because if it is fast, you can apply advanced things later. But if it starts out and it's not fast, it's very hard to make it fast later. So we built it with speed in mind. Uh, obviously, we use the best technology, the right open source projects, the right architecture, and we'll talk about why that is. Uh, but we believe that to be, this is a machine speed problem, not a human speed problem. Uh, so we want to count our our latency in milliseconds and not seconds. How many milliseconds? So we, on the average day, process billions and billions of events. Actually, yesterday, I think we processed slightly over 12 billion events. Uh, and with the average processing time is less than 10 milliseconds. That's to do, and I'll, I'll, over the next couple of slides, I'll show you all of the things we're doing in less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, and like I said, uh, speed has a quality all its own. Uh, because you can deliver insights faster, you can apply later transformations at incredible scale, you can do things in sequence that if you start out and you're over some several seconds, it's very hard to make things fast later. How fast is 10 milliseconds? It's about 50 times faster than you blink your eye, and it's about, if anybody remembers what analog cameras looked like, a 1 60th uh, shutter uh, is about 10 milliseconds, so pretty fast. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes uh, on our high-level diagram. Um, and before I start this, we are in the process of writing a white paper and open sourcing many of the, not just the architecture, but the code we use to do this. Uh, so obviously, feel free to take a picture with your phone. Uh, but over the summer, we're going to be open sourcing this uh, somewhere to follow. 
Uh, and we view this as the start of a discussion, not the end of a discussion. Um, and for those of you that have seen some of these other booths outside, you'll recognize a lot of these tools. Uh, I want to start with number one, ori orienting you to my diagram. On the lower left, we have an abstraction for our on-premise data centers. Uh, so I'm going to start there. Uh, starting from the lower left, where that one just appeared, we have log collectors in multiple data centers. We scale them horizontally. We have internal load balancing. Uh, and additionally, uh, we apply beyond core principles. These are denied by default. These are control, controlled by programmatic regular key rotation via service account. They communicate only via two-way SSL, 443 over the internet. They're accessible via a fully qualified domain name internally and externally, you know, things like this. Um, and additionally, we apply metadata. One of the key things about a publish and subscribe framework like this is you thou shalt apply metadata. We apply metadata about as many things as we can think of. And we also have a framework that allows us to change the kinds of metadata that we apply without fundamentally re-architecting our system or taking the system offline to do that. That's because we have this load balance configuration. Uh, and some of the uh, SRE principles you probably heard about in the Five Nines Lounge, we apply throughout this pipeline. Uh, and two, uh, we have what we call cloud-to-cloud -cloud data. As I said, the city has a hybrid cloud strategy. Uh, so we, via API and service accounts using the same beyond core principles, key rotation, et cetera, extract that data via API from multiple public cloud providers, including Google, including others. Uh, and that's because we want to leverage the investments that the city has made in these clouds to provide cutting-edge services to residents uh, and in introduce them into our pipeline. Uh, and number three, kind of the, the middle part of the slide, uh, we have a ingestion front end. It's a pub sub. Uh, as you know, you might have, you could probably guess, it uses a topic and subscription schema. Uh, this topic and subscription schema is one that is primarily used later in our pipeline to parse and prepare logs for consumers, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, and so there's a front end. Uh, we call that ingest right where to the left of the three. Uh, and what it does is it takes in data from all of these places, from our data centers, from our other public cloud providers, uh, and it adds it to the right topic. It applies a little bit more metadata, uh, and it passes it off to something we call flow control. Flow control is an Apache Beam pipeline which ensures that the data is in the right format, that the data is expected, uh, and really it's a place that we can apply metadata level automation and normalization across this data without, in nerd speak, deserializing these packets. Uh, and that's, like I said, because we want it to be fast. Because we want, and because we use multiple concurrent topics, we want to be able to serve the data as fast as our fastest consumer wants to consume it, rather than be limited by as slow as our slowest process. So to do that, that is why we have two Apache Beam subscriptions, if you will, instead of one like some of the other uh, pipelines you might see uh, around the hall. I also want to point your attention to the, there's a blue box, which is our primary, uh, and there's also a gray box, which says replica. Uh, and so we have, we rely on Google managed services, which provide a high, high level of reliability, but we, via our infrastructure's code and other processes, replicate this pipeline to other geographic locations, uh, and that's to ensure continuity and disaster recovery. Uh, and we don't, quote, operate two separate infrastructures via infrastructure's code. We simply tell Google, put this over there as well. And I'll get into that also. Uh, and number four, we have another Apache Beam pipeline which parses data. And broadly speaking, our consumers want a variety of things. And I mean consumers, I mean analytical processes and tools. Some analytical processes and tools want data to be normalized. They just want you to make sure it's, uh, they just want a well-formatted JSON message and they're happy. Some of them want the data to be fully indexed. They want it to be transformed into a CSV or an Avro or another type of message which has a high structure. Others want the data to be fully digitized. So you might imagine that those are, some of those are relatively straightforward to do and some of those are not. Uh, because we use this publish and subscribe framework, because we have these two message buses, these two pub sub you know, sandwiches, if you will, we can do that, like I said, and serve our fastest customer now and our, quote, slowest customer at their own speed. Uh, and that is, I think, a key differentiator with our architecture. And like I said, that enables us to be fast and stay fast. Uh, number five, we call this the replicator. Uh, 
we have a production and development environment. Uh, and importantly about our development environment is it's only there when we want it. Obviously, we're civil servants. These are taxpayer resources. In addition to effectiveness, we need to be ruthlessly efficient. So we don't have a separate development environment which is, quote, sitting around waiting, us for, to, waiting for us to develop. The infrastructure is code. We stand up a development environment when we want to push major changes, when we want to do attack framework testing, when we want to test integrations and in other services, things like this, uh, and we do that via the replicator. Uh, we have a variety of projects ongoing at any one time, a variety of stakeholders which want what we might call R&D or non-production level access to our data. And this replicator enables us to take some, all, or some subset of our production data, put it to these, apply masking, apply tokenization, and other processes without affecting these downstream consumers. Uh, and that allows us to continue to apply best practices beyond corp type principles throughout this production pipeline. Uh, moving right along, these are just some of the consumers, automation and orchestration, dashboard and alerting, data warehouse. I'm actually going to, during the demo, I'll show you BigQuery, uh, which we use for our data warehouse. Uh, but this is, like I said, just one small part of a very large production system. Number seven, uh, if you see, is in the middle top. Uh, infrastructure's code means that your operators write software. Software requires CI, CD, code repos and artifact storage, so we have that. Uh, there's no secret. It's people writing software. Uh, and like anything, uh, it requires maybe a change of perspective or a change in the way your operational teams might think of themselves. But we found that uh, the engineers and operators on our team have really embraced this challenge. Uh, so I think that it is, it is a journey that certainly doesn't happen overnight, uh, but one that uh, we've been found to be very successful. Uh, and last but certainly not least is uh, we use the Identity Aware Proxy to broker access from users to all of our production applications. That means that we have context-aware access with user identity, with device state, with other things. Uh, and again, uh, this enables us to get right data, right analysts, right time. So with that, demo. Can we uh, switch the display? OK, great. So here we have a number of virtual machine instances. Actually, this one is the booth demo. So I won't shut this down, or Andrew uh, would be very sad, and I'd be very sad. Uh, so this is the booth demo. Uh, you see uh, data flow is just virtual machines. So there's no secret. Again, there's no secrets here. It's just virtual machines running Java. Um, but now I'll go to this live demo. Uh, and this is actually the same code that's in the demo outside, but instead of those awesome buttons that you press, for those of you that have seen it, I'm just going to press buttons on a keyboard. Um, give it a sec just to go to space and back. OK, great. So this is, again, the same button demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish a malicious, a malicious message. So I published a malicious SSH log. And the last four digits of the message ID are 9816. So remember those numbers. It'll, those are tests later. Uh, and so these are all the data flow jobs. And there's two ways you can view this. One, here are all our data flow jobs. Two, here are all the machines that are running those data flow jobs. Uh, but you see they are things like third party SSH, DNS. So these are data flow jobs that are subscribing to our hub subtopics, applying transformation, and automagically giving it to another pub subtopic, which is then writing it to BigQuery. So that's at a high level what's going on. And as we move over to BigQuery in a sec, imagine not just me on the console in BigQuery applying the SQL queries. Imagine this were a unified framework with an automation and orchestration harness where these queries could be run automatically via the BigQuery API. These transformations could be applied and rerun many times a day in parallel and in sequence. Automation could be kicked off both in this environment and within other stakeholders' environments. Uh, so this is a trivial demo to show you kind of the power of a framework like this. Additionally, because we're using BigQuery and Google tools like this, our analysts actually mostly don't use the BigQuery UI. Most of them use Jupyter Notebooks, IPython Notebooks, and things like that to prototype within our development environment, which we then 
normal software development process, promote to production uh, via our automation and orchestration framework. So all of this uh, is preamble to maybe first we'll just, and this is just SQL, again, nothing earth shattering, just select from our demo and make sure that our message is there. Uh, you'll have to take my word for it, but it is the same message. Uh, and you see, so time, source IP, source port, destination IP, right? Failure. So this, for example, could be a malicious actor attempting to SSH into a host that was within our on-premise data center, right? So let's say that, it, you know, let's take that uh, as the example. Uh, and again, this would probably not be in the context of a BigQuery UI. This would be in the context of an alerting dashboard uh, and a response process. Um, so obviously, let's take a look at this address, the destination IP. So we receive an alert about someone trying to do something bad to our host. Now let's see what else is happening to this host briefly. So now we're just saying, give me all the SSH logs from our host. Okay, so we see a bunch of failures and undetermined, which is a different kind of failure, and SSH logs, undetermined, we see a success. Okay, and I actually see a, lo a bunch of failures within the recent time frame. So this is 308, 302. So these are all temporally relatively recent. Failure, success, doesn't matter, undetermined, interesting. So let's say there's this 110 address, which we see kind of a, a bunch of failures from. So now we have understood, we received an alert, someone's trying to SSH into this system. We look back, let's call it 10 minutes, and we see a bunch of other failures, not from this initial system, but from other systems trying to access the same system. So this could be a brute force SSH attempt. That's what this could be. Uh, now, let's just filter by this 110 address and maybe see if we can see anything else going on. Okay, now all 22, 22, 22, okay, failure, they're all failures. So now I'm more convinced still that this is a brute force SSH attempt. Um, now let's see, we have just the SSH logs here. Let's pivot from SSH to all the logs that we have. Now for the purposes of this demo, we have DNS, SSH, web server logs, but in quote, real life, you might have a number of different log sources that would depend on how your use cases and your threat management team or whatever your processes are developed. But for the purposes of this demo, it's just, it's just a few. Okay, so we see more of these port 22. Now we see a bunch of DNS. So we see 53 mail.google, so we see a bunch of other things going on. Uh, and at this point, this might be the point at which this was delivered to a human analyst. Everything up to now could have been, you, could, you don't have to necessarily have a person do it. It's, to prototype, you would obviously have to design these queries, implement thresholds, production, unit testing, smoke testing. Again, no secrets about how you know, these processes would have to be undertaken, but let's say, you, brute forcing SSH against a jump server were one of your use cases, this might be the kind of contextual, quote, advanced automation you could do with a pipeline like this. Um, so a lot of DNS and SSH. So let's see, other than this, if they tried to connect to anything else. So now I'm, maybe I'm a human analyst. I'm in my IPython notebook. I'm sitting and I say, okay, I have my source IP. I already know there's a bunch of DNS and SSH, so I'm kind of done looking at DNS, DNS and SSH, so let's look at other stuff. Okay, so now they have tried to connect to something else, and this is a brand new system. I didn't know about this system before. It wasn't, it wasn't kind of organic to my alert, but I've pivoted from a brute force, an SSH alert that was decorated, that was enriched by our pipeline and data within our data, with, data within our data warehouse. I then served that to an analyst who then applied, 
human machine learning, human thinking, and said, I'm interested in this alert. Let's see if they try to connect, connect to anything else. And now I could do this whole process again with this new indicator, a potential indicator of attack. And again, I wouldn't necessarily have to run all these queries again. I could simply feed this back into the system, wait a couple milliseconds for another decorated uh, contextual uh, data element to appear to me as a human analyst, and on we go. So that's uh, the end of that demo. Um, and now back to the slides. If you could switch back to the other one. OK, great. Um, so zero trust and zero touch. I have just a couple of minutes before I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, and zero touch, infrastructure as code. Um, and how do we deploy systems today as an organization? Obviously, the city is a hybrid cloud provider. It has, uh, like I said, a long history of computing excellence. Uh, physical data centers are here to stay. Data gravity is an important consideration in how applications are designed and architected. Uh, we're dedicated to ensuring that those systems are also secure and reliable. Uh, but like I said, we wanted to implement a fully infrastructure as code, a fully zero touch application. Uh, and that means that we had to transition or enhance our operational processes from those of pure IT operations to development operations, DevOps, and SRE principles. That means that we have peer review. All codes are pushed to a central repo, reviewed by a select group. Uh, auditability is 100%. Uh, and our controls are technically enforced. So we have, obviously, robust policy documents which delineate who can make changes to what. Uh, but don't just take my word for it. We segment our environment by project, by repository, uh, and using Terraform and you know, open source CI CD tools, we can technically enforce our policies. Uh, and again, one of the principles that I, I saw and I read, uh, I responded to, is we don't want to blame people when something fails. We want to blame the system. So we wanted to construct a system to allow people, knowing that they are fallible, to receive the maximum technical enforcement of our already agreed upon principles as an engineering culture. Um, and that means that, you know, and some of those things started with infrastructure as code, but they go to good peer reviews, they go to lunch and learns, they go to a robust, blameless post-mortem culture. Uh, and if you don't have these principles and you don't technically enforce these tools, uh, at least in, in our experience, it's easy to enhance a system in which it is accepted that people are human beings infallible and that we seek to technically enforce things that we all agree on, rather than saying you should be more careful. Uh, and infrastructure as code, again, there's no secrets. This is actually part of the code that runs the demo. Uh, and you see that these are, if any of you have used Kafka, if you haven't used Cloud PubSub and you have used Kafka, these look like Kafka topics because these are Cloud PubSub topics, and that's basically what they are. So we ingest third party. We do things, flow control. Uh, so again, secret is there's no secret. And again, because we're using infrastructure as code, because we have uh, in the documentation, you know, we might say that if I were reviewing Andrew's code, I'd say, I, would, I want more documentation on your code. It's not really clear to me what these variables are. But let's pretend that you know, as part of our code review, we can ensure that our infrastructure as code is well documented because we're not at some different point in time taking some snapshot of our environment and then documenting it. This is the documentation of our environment right here, the infrastructure as code. Um, and like I said, we have a full development and testing environment. We have geographically redundant uh, components for critical systems. And we don't do that by clicking a bunch of buttons. We do that by introducing variables into our Terraform code, which is what this is. This is HCL, uh, and having the computer do it for us. Uh, and zero trust. And for those of you that haven't heard about Beyond Corp or haven't read the white papers uh, from Forrester Research or uh, by Google themselves, uh, in Beyond Corp, we remove the trust in the network and place it in what we know about the user, the device, and the context. Uh, our pipeline uses these principles, again, throughout the pipeline uh, to ensure that our environment is secure. And because we believe that this is the future way that applications will be architected. And again, this isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, 
The city has been a city actually about 120 years longer than the United States of America has been a country. So the city as an organization is one with a rich history of transition and using inflection points. And we're confident that the city is going to uh, move in this direction. Uh, and we're excited to be a very small part of that team of teams, uh, like I said, that's going to do it. Um, but you have to start someplace. And for those you know, in the audience, I, I want to do infrastructure as code. I want to try Beyond Corp. This is a big, important application. But it's one in which we deliberately selected to apply both of these principles, uh, not just because we believe in those principles, we think they're the future, and we think they're important. But this was small enough to be accomplishable, but big enough to matter. And I think selecting the kind of problem or project you, as an organization, apply these you know, cutting edge, next generation, whatever you want to call it, principles for is important. Uh, and moving right along, as a, another way of analogy, uh, because Game of Thrones is restarting, we wanted to put a picture of a castle in. Um, and so the analogy is simple. We have a castle. Uh, we have old. We have legacy. We have all these systems. Uh, and we need to do two things at once. We need to chew bubblegum and walk. We need to embrace next generation technologies and novel approaches to solving problems while ensuring that our existing systems are robust and secure. Uh, and since the adoption of the internet, uh, many organizations have tried and succeeded in doing this. Uh, and we think that our organization, with the help of Google and other partners, is going to succeed as well. And that your organization, hopefully, uh, can too. Uh, in the future, just a couple minutes, machine learning and advanced automation. Like I said at the beginning, people don't want machine learning. They want learning. And they don't want advanced automation. They want the thing they want done to be done really fast. Uh, so a data-centric, automation-focused approach like that you saw here uh, enables that. Um, and Centaur Chess, what we're, our vision for what we want to do isn't to hire a bunch of robots to replace a bunch of people. That's never going to happen. What we want to do, and if you've never heard of Centaur Chess, it's a person unpersoned or a person-machine team. Uh, a computer applies the strategy and tactics of its human operator. So using a person to think strategically, to draw analogy, to make plans and designs, and then having a system execute those at high velocity, high reliability, and high scale. That's what we're trying to do. Training, machine learning pun intended, people and machines to work together. And last but not least, key takeaways. One, the benefit of using the public cloud for this purpose, scalability, performance, efficiency, and the ability to technology leapfrog. The, we selected a brand new application that was important, executive sponsorship, big impact, and we, we sought to apply these principles on purpose. Uh, two, our approach, zero trust, zero touch, uh, and the power of data, which broadly speaking, one of the primary, the first things we did was robust retrospective search, but that's just the beginning. Uh, and number three, enable the future today with automation, machine learning, publish and subscribe frameworks, uh, and number four, not on the slide, white paper coming this summer. Hopefully, we start a conversation with all of you. Follow us on Twitter, New York City Cyber Command. Questions about any of this, uh, we have uh, a contact email up there. Uh, and for any information about our office, about us, about what we do, about our programs, nyc.gov slash cyber. And that's, that's it. <laughs>